Hello friends. So I'm here. This is going to be a very different episode of Rick Henry's talk show. Okay, I am going to be talking about what I have been going through the past four months. Hasn't been easy. Some would call it tragedy. I feel though that it's something that I have to discuss. Uh, it's something that I feel could be helpful to a lot of people and to myself. So let me start at the beginning. So back in 2019, around August, September 2019, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. So that was like, that was a big deal to me. I mean, cancer, wow. Uh, and then pandemic hit in March 2020, which I was going to start my treatments in April, but the doctor suggested we wait. You know, pandemic and all, we had no idea what was going on at that point, April 2020. So I ended up having my treatments done in August and September of 2020, but this was the life changer for me. I'm like thinking this is, I've never had anything like this happen. This is the worst thing that ever happened to me, cancer, you know? So then months go by, November rolls around, all of a sudden, out of the blue, my mom starts having uh, delusions. She's seeing things. She's hearing things. There's people there that aren't there, and she's talking to herself. I mean, it was getting really bad. My brother and I were dealing with this. My brother and I both live in the house with my mom. We've been caring for her since 2013. My dad was uh, with us when we first moved into the house. The reason we moved in is because my mom asked us to move in because he was sick. Our father was sick. My mom is completely blind, and she's like, I can't take care of him by myself. So we moved in to help care for my dad and my mom. Anyway, he passed away in 2017. So my mom starts having all these delusions, and it's just like, really? I mean, she's staying up like 20 30 hours without any sleep and just really crazy stuff, crazy, crazy bothering stuff. And we're on the phone and, and messaging back and forth with my mom's doctor every day. And she's try this, try that. She stopped uh, medication thinking that medication was causing the delusions. She's thinking maybe uh, uh, dehydration. And she gives my mom, prescribes a few different pills that we try, nothing works. So after about 10 days of dealing with this in the home, we, uh, my brother and I decided to take her to the emergency room. It was a horrible experience. My mom had no idea what was going on. She thought she was being kidnapped. When we took her, when I took her, they would only let one of us in. She thought, once she was in the emergency room, she thought she was being kidnapped. She was hollering and screaming, kicking, biting, punching. Uh, and at one point when they got her on the bed, they had to pull her up, drag her up to the pillow. And I mean, it just broke my heart. She started screaming. I remember my mom's completely blind and 84 years old. She just started screaming as they were dragging her up, her, her up so she, her head could be on the pillow. She started screaming and she said, help me, help me, someone, they're, they're trying to kill me, they're dragging me. I was in tears. I was in tears. So she ends up in the hospital for three weeks. And that was a horrible time for me. Because, you know, this is all during COVID. 
and uh, had all kinds of restrictions on the hospitals. I was not able, none of us, they wouldn't let anybody into the hospital to visit her, nobody. I, I was just, I mean, three weeks not being able to visit her, knowing that she's very confused, can't see, blind, can barely hear out of either ear. I mean, it was really tough. I was just, I mean, I was just a mess, a real mess. I would call. I didn't get through to her every day, but I would call. So the times that I did get through, sometimes my mom, well, at first she just really didn't know who I was. And she said some very, very strange things. And it just got me really worried. And after a while, after about a week and a half or so, she, she knew who I was and she even called me by name and recognized my voice and was happy to hear me, but it still wasn't the same, you know, still was not the same. And at one point in one of the conversations, she goes, well, when are you going to come pick me up? I just want to come home. And hearing her say that with a tone of voice, the yearning in her voice, that just tore me apart. So she finally came home on December 11th, 2020. And it was a whole different situation. She was diagnosed with dementia with psychosis and major depressive disorder. So my mom's all messed up in the brain. Not only that, I found out about three hours later after she gets home that they had her in diapers. All of a sudden, my mom's incontinent. So guess what? I had to learn how to change. Well, I, didn't, I don't have her in diapers. I have her in what's called adult, or, or they're called pull-ups. So they're padded underwear. So I had to learn how to clean her and change her and all that, which I do. I taught my brother. At first he was squeamish about it, you know, seeing his mom's private parts. I told him, you know what, you have to look at this as a medical deal. Not that you're looking or seeing your mom naked. So once I explained it that way, he was on board. He learned. He did pretty good. And we, my brother and I have a good situation going. He was working early mornings, coming home by 10, 10 a.m. I, I would leave at 10.15 to be to work at 10.30. So we both kept our jobs. There was always somebody here uh, with my mom caring for her. One of her sons that she trusts and knows and recognizes our voices. So it came in January, time for me to go back to work. The paid family leave of absence payments stopped at the beginning of January. So I lost about a week and a half of pay before I went back to work. That's fine, not a problem. So I go back to work. I work for one week, okay? I work for a week. And then I'm starting my second week, Monday morning. My brother calls me up at like, 6 a.m. saying, I'm coming home early, Rick. I'm really sick. I'm like, okay. So I'm like thinking, oh boy, if he is really sick, I'm going to have to stay home and take care of mom. So here I am, Monday of my second week back to work, and I'm already calling out sick. After having been off for two months, yes, I was off for two months, and I'm already calling out sick. They understood. Bosses at work understood. My brother seems okay the next day. He goes back to work on Tuesday, and I go to work on Tuesday. When I get home from work, though, he's back. He's hyperventilating. His chest is hurting, so on and so forth. So Wednesday was both of our days off. This is Wednesday the 27th, January 27th, 2021, I believe. We both have a day off. I told him, you better go and get yourself tested for the virus because you have some of the symptoms of it. And with mom here, we, you know, 
we can't we can't be spreading we can't let her get sick so i tell my brother that you know with the virus going around and the symptoms that he has that he really needs to go get himself tested so we found a place in anaheim that does same day testing and gives you results in 15 minutes so he came back negative Okay, so that was a good thing. We had no clue what was going on. So I told him that you better go get this checked out. I told him you better go to uh, urgent care and get this figured out. I was thinking, I mean, he was thinking it was anxiety because that's something he had uh, dealt with in the past. I was thinking maybe it was high blood pressure. Because I, I told him, you know, it's been several days now, and if this was anxiety, it probably most likely would have subsided by now. And it seemed to be getting worse. He was having chest pains, and, uh, and, uh, the, uh, shortness of breath. So, he went to urgent care, and once he got there, they checked him out and such did some blood work and everything. They figured out that he was severely diabetic and that he had had several mini heart attacks. Now my brother, he just never took care of himself. He never ever went to a doctor. He refused to go to a doctor. I think the last time he actually went to a doctor was back in uh, 2007 when he had a pretty bad cold and uh, they told him they couldn't do anything for a cold, just, you know, take some over-the-counter medication. That was the last time we went to a doctor. There were many times, many times, I can remember 2015 telling him, you know, you need to go to a doctor, you're 50-some-odd years old, and it's time for you to, you know, start getting regular checkups. He got pretty upset with me. He just refused. So anyway, he's in the hospital, and... Uh, they put a stent in his heart. Then they put this other deal, I guess, through the arteries in his legs, reaching up to his heart. And uh, eventually, within four days, he passed away. So that was a really hard deal for me. That was something that, I mean, th this really shook me up. I mean, it turned my whole life upside down. We had everything planned perfect. We were both able to keep our jobs and still have someone there at the house to take care of our mom. Mom, you know, even though she was dealing with the dementia, she was in, always in a pretty good mood, had a lot of energy. She was exercising every day. Her sense of humor was there. and She was talking a lot, conversing a whole lot. And, uh, but after my brother passed away, it's, she lost a lot. She wasn't the same anymore. The sense of humor gone. Rarely does she ever joke around anymore. Her energy, she doesn't exercise anymore. She refuses, she won't, I try. And when I do get her to exercise, it's very little and she just doesn't have the energy. So since my brother passed away, my mom has developed separation issues or abandonment issues. She's afraid of being alone. I mean, I will leave for two minutes to go and see if, we've, if the mail has arrived yet. And I remember one time I did that. I was only gone for two minutes just to look for the mail. When I got back, my mom was sitting on the edge of her bed, shaking. She was just literally shaking her whole body. And I'm like, I go and sit down next to her. I go, sweetie, sweetie, what's wrong? What's wrong? And she goes, oh, I thought you weren't coming back. I got, uh, I got afraid. I thought you weren't coming back. I thought you were just going to leave me here alone. And, oh, that broke my heart. And seriously, I broke into tears. And I tried to speak clearly to her, but I, I, I couldn't speak. Finally, I got the words out. And I said, 
Oh, Mom, I, was, I would never leave you. I would never leave you. I just went down to check the mail. And I convinced her, I go, Mom, I'm here with you. I'm here for good. And I'm here to love you and to protect you and make sure that you're safe and get you whatever you need, Mom. I'm here. And then she just goes, I know, I know, I just got scared. So dementia is really a very tricky illness. I'm looking at my little monitor here. I keep a monitor with me everywhere I go so that way I can keep an eye on my mom. This is my life now. I love the little lady though, so she's well worth all this effort that I put into it. Anyhow, dementia is a really very tricky illness. It's not a one-size-fits-all illness, and it's very unpredictable. I mean, one day my mom can be somewhat lucid and converse really well and remember things pretty well and know that she's here at the house. And then the next day, even sometimes within the same day, hours later, she won't know where she's at. She'll think that maybe she's at at the hospital or at a restaurant. A lot of times she thinks she's at a restaurant. And then sometimes she'll think that I'm a waiter or maybe she'll think that I'm her older sister, Margaret, my, my aunt Margaret. She mentions Margaret a lot. Sometimes she'll think that I'm my dad. Sometimes she'll think I'm my brother Chris who passed away. I did tell her about Chris the day after he passed away. And for the first four days, she seemed very lucid. And her first response, I told her, was, well, we're going to have to make arrangements for him then. And I said, okay, we will do that. In the next four days or so, every day she'd ask me, so how are the arrangements going? How much is it going to cost? I want to pay for this, so on and so forth. And I'm like, great, she's accepting this. But then after four days, she starts asking about him, well, where's Chris? And she would ask in a very yearning, kind of sad voice, where is Chris? Is he at work? Has he gone to bed yet? And uh, so, you know, I called the Alzheimer's hotline on this. How do I answer these questions? So they let me know that I don't want to continuously break her heart by telling her every single time that she asks about him that he's passed away. So they basically said, just go along with it. Make something up. So sometimes I'll tell her that, well, Chris is out visiting with one of his friends, or Chris is asleep, or Chris is not at home, simply. You know, it's really hard. It's really, really very hard when she keeps bringing him up. I'd like to be able to move past this, but it is tough. It's tough because I know her heart is broken and it's breaking my heart to know that and to see how she is, how lonely she is sometimes. Yeah, this is this is your son, Rick. Oh, is it? Yes, it is. And you're in your bedroom now. Uh-huh. And I will not be leaving you alone, okay? Okay. Are you all right? Yeah. Okay. What are you looking for? My tissues. Oh, your tissues are in the box right mm. over here. Okay, I got her. Okay. So what happened? Huh? What happened? What do you mean, what happened? Oh, I don't know. Are you, you're okay? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. You comfortable? Yeah. Okay. Would you like me to make you an egg sandwich? Egg? Yeah, egg and avocado. Would what, you, what you mean boiled egg? Yeah. 
Well, I, I would only want a half of one. Okay. On some bread? That would mean I would... That would mean I would have to go down to the kitchen and you'll be up here by yourself in your bedroom for about 10 minutes. Already? Are you okay with that? Or do you just want me to stay instead? No, I'm going to stay down here. No, you're upstairs in your bedroom, not downstairs, Mom. Huh? You're upstairs in your bedroom right now. I am? Yes, you are. Well, I'm staying up here because Chris brought me up. No, no, that was Rick who brought you up, Mama. That was Rick. It was? Yes. And that's who you're talking to right now. This is Rick that you're talking with. Well, of course, Chris. <laughs> well, Mama, he is not home right now, okay? Huh? He is not home right now. Okay? He's not? Right. Yeah, he's not home. Well, I don't want to go anywhere. I'm tired. Okay, you don't need to go anywhere, Mama. You don't need to go anywhere. You can stay right here. Hmm? You can stay right here. That's fine. I'm saying. Okay. Um... But if you want an egg sandwich, I will have to go downstairs to the kitchen. But you can stay here up in your room. I don't, I don't know what I want. Okay. Well, if you're not hungry, then we'll just both stay up here. How's that sound? Chris, are you here? Mama, this is Rick. Chris is not here. Where is he? Who's this? This is Ricky. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. This is Ricky, your son Ricky. Oh. Okay. Well, I don't know. Chris was going to sleep with me. No, I'm going to stay here with you, Mama. Mm. Well, I'm going to lay down. Okay. Where are we at, anyway? We're up in your bedroom. Huh? We're up in your bedroom, Mama. Oh, in my, my room? Yeah, we are. Well, why don't we go up there and sleep? Well, that's where we are, up in your bedroom right now. Oh. So you can sleep here in your bed. This is your bed, okay? Okay. What did you say? Where does your brother live? Um, he lives up, way up in the mountains. Oh, really? Up in the hills, yeah. Mm. Yep, up close to where the clouds are. Okay, well, I wanted to do this because I want to share with everybody what you go through, what you experience when you live with someone, when you are caring for someone who has dementia. I mean, it's tough. I mean, not, not dementia, but, but advanced stages of dementia. It's not easy. It can be done. You have to be strong. You have to believe that you can do this. You have to believe if you're going to do it and make it through it, you have to believe that you can do it. You can't be saying, oh, my life is over. I'm losing my identity. I, you know, I, you can't be saying any of that stuff because you're not losing your identity and your life is not over. You are doing 
an important job. So you just have to be strong and you have to tell yourself that you can do it. Tell yourself that you are going to be victorious through this and you're going to see it through. It's not easy, but it can be done. I hope that you have learned something from this presentation and I thank you friends for being here for me. Many of you have given me support in many different ways. Financial support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moral support. Being a shoulder there for me, listening to me. And I am so grateful. I thank you for all you have done for me, my friends. I've had some people say to me, well, it's like taking care of a baby, isn't it? Well, to be honest with you, no, nah. Only thing in common with taking care of a baby is that oftentimes at two o'clock in the morning, I am waking up in order to change, you know, change her underpants, clean her up and everything. Yeah, that happens. Other than that, you know, a baby is not 125 pounds. You know how hard it is to move or maneuver a 125 pound person versus say maybe a 10 pound baby? Big, big difference. Plus, most babies, say you're old and younger, they don't argue back with you. Maybe they might kick a little bit, but they don't argue back with you. They don't try to throw some sort of fractured logic at you also. I mean, big, big difference between taking care of an adult that has dementia and taking care of a newborn, healthy baby child. No comparison whatsoever. So what is dementia? Dementia is, well, let me put it in simple terms here. Dementia is the deterioration or shrinking of your brain, which affects your memory and other cognitive and motor skills. Okay, so this can affect your uh, speaking. It can affect your uh, ability to make simple decisions. It can affect your uh, the eating. Uh, getting dressed, brushing your teeth. I mean, any number of daily, ordinary tasks that we all just kind of take for granted can affect all of this. Uh, dementia also uh, is a, this deterioration also causes a confusion, which uh, can bring on a, a delusional state of mind uh, such as hallucinations and just really, I mean, just really be something that's hard to deal with. Uh, Alzheimer and dementia is one of the most confusing and saddest illnesses that any person could ever encounter. So I want to address a few. Uh, so I want to address a few So, so I want to address a few frequently asked questions. So one of them is, who's at risk for Alzheimer's dementia? Okay, uh, well, age, elderly people definitely are more at risk because as you age, your brain does deteriorate. Doesn't mean that every single elderly person will end up with dementia, but you are more at risk. Also, if you have a family history, uh, you know, in your genetics, that puts you at risk. Uh, people with uh, 
things such as uh, smoking, smoking, drinking alcohol to excess, uh, high cholesterol, plaque, you know, build up a plaque, especially in your brain. So it's really important to uh, be treating things such as high cholesterol and plaque. Uh, that means seeing your doctor on a regular basis. Uh, next question is, so how can you prevent dementia? And there's a few things that you can do to possibly prevent, and nothing is foolproof here, but there are things that you can do to possibly prevent uh, dementia. One is uh, remaining at a healthy weight, uh, exercise, so the healthy weight and exercise go hand in hand, um, eating healthy, again, right there, those three go hand in hand, healthy weight, exercise, and eating healthy. Uh, you want to maintain your health problems, such as uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. You want to keep all of that in check, because uh, you let those things get, get out of hand, it is going to affect your brain. Uh, you want to stay mentally alert with hobbies, doing puzzles, reading, you know, stuff like that. Anything that works your, your brain, works your mind. And uh, you want to stay involved socially, such as maybe uh, community activities, support groups, churches. Uh, you can do volunteer work. And uh, if your doctor recommends it, if recommended by your doctor, uh, take aspirin. But once again, that's only if that's recommended by your doctor. Okay, so why did I decide to care for my mom? I mean, there are a few choices here. I mean, I could have sold this house. I could have taken the easy way out, sold the house, and then used that money to put my mom in a home. And I would go on with my life. Yeah, I'd visit her regularly and such. But I would just go on with my life. So why, why in the world, when I have that, choice? Why in the world did I make the tough choice? Why did I choose the tough choice? I mean, I'm keeping my mom here at home. I'm caring for her, which is a lot of work and it's tough. And I'm doing it by myself, on my own. And I don't have an income because I'm not able to work right now because I'm caring for her. I'm physically and mentally, yes, I'm able to keep a job and do very well, but I'm caring for my mom, which is a 24 seven job. So why did I make that decision? I mean, I thought about it. Oh boy, believe me, I thought about it. Selling the house and everything. I gave it a whole lot of thought. And I thought, well, I can go there after work every day or before work or, you know, and all my days off and, and see my mom. And then when I thought about it, it's just, I got this feeling, this strong feeling like a chill that went up and down my, my spine and my stomach began feeling queasy. I'm like, no, I can't do that. I can't leave my little sweetie I got to take care of her. And that's what she wanted. She told me, she said she wanted me to stay with her and take care of her. That's what she told me after my brother Chris passed away. So I told her that I would do it. So yeah, it's a whole lot of work caring for my mom. But, you know, it's, it's worth it. I mean, this is my decision to do what I'm doing. I mean, since the loss of my brother, I'm not able to go to work. And it wouldn't make any sense for me to go to work because uh, my mom's income, I mean, she makes about fifteen fifty a month from Social Security. That's all she gets. And that goes towards uh, paying the mortgage on the house because they, my parents borrowed on the house twice 
They bought it in 1975. It should be paid off by now, but they bought, borrowed on it twice. So uh, her money goes towards a mortgage and she pays all the utilities. After that's done, she has about $200 left over, which is about maybe pays for like one day of a caregiver. So I did the math. And if I were to go to work, my income would my income I would have to hand over my entire paycheck I'm working full time I would have to hand over my entire paycheck each week to a caregiver and that still wouldn't be enough to pay uh, for someone to be here 50 hours a week providing I mean I would hire someone who's professional I'm not going to have somebody who doesn't know what they're doing professionals you're going to be paying them 20 to 35 dollars an hour so that's a good amount of money so you know it's a lot of work I'm here I'm not getting an income right now so that's tough I can't just leave whenever I want to so it's almost like you know being a prisoner here at home uh these glasses make my eyes look funny so it's uh I mean it's, it's tough it's really tough you know and I have friends who tell me well, but, but Rick you have to take care of yourself you have to watch out for your own health and you know I understand I get it I know that my friends are they're looking out for me okay so I'm back someone rang the doorbell and they walked away just before I could answer the door anyhow though back to what I was saying I understand I get it my friends are looking out for me but you know what? that's really not what I want to hear you know tell me tell me that you understand tell me that you get it tell me that you know it's tough what I'm doing but please please you know I don't want to hear people telling me to well you got to take care of yourself Rick because I already know that and I am taking care of myself you know it's 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 tough but yeah I'm taking care of myself I'm not getting the exercise I should be getting but I do do some exercise main thing is I'm eating healthy you know I got my vegetables my proteins so on and so forth pretty good well balanced diet and I'm drinking water and I'm keeping a pretty good healthy frame of mind you know that's one thing too a lot of my friends are concerned about is my mental my mental health my mental state of mind and you know I have my days yeah I've got my days just yesterday I was in the backyard watering the plants you know and I looked at the house you know when, when my brother and I moved back into the family house back in uh, 2013 my mom asked us to move back in because my dad had become ill he had a few strokes and her being blind she being blind she knew she could not take care of him so she asked us to move into the house to help out with him and uh, so we did that uh, when we moved in the house needed a lot of help one of the things was the the uh, the screens on the windows on the back of the house were all tattered just from age from wear from the sun from the rain so they were all tattered and torn well, my brother, he took every single one of those screens and replaced them, and they look great. So yesterday when I'm watering the plants, and I look at the back of the house, and I see those screens and how nice they look, I, I mean, I just, I broke into tears, you know, just thinking about this, all that's happened, and just how heartbroken my mom is. You know, I just, I couldn't help it. I broke into tears, you know. But that's a good thing. I'm not afraid to face my emotions, you know. I'm not afraid to, if I have tears coming, I'm not afraid to let them out, you know. If, if there's something bothering me, I'm not afraid to get on the phone and talk to a friend about it or, or message back and forth with a friend about it. I'm not afraid to face my emotions. And that's part of what is keeping me healthy, keeping me sane. And that's a big reason why I am still going and I'm able to take care of my mom. So, since I am unable to work at the moment, I do do different things to uh, to bring money in. I do surveys every day, every single day. I do 
probably about three or four surveys a day, and each survey brings me about a dollar or so. Not a whole lot of money, but that does add up, and then after a month's time, maybe that's about a hundred dollars, which that hundred dollars does help, and it's not really a whole lot of effort. I'm sitting here anyway most of the time. Even when I'm here talking with my mom, I can do a simple survey, not a problem. I also do a photo restoration. I feel I'm pretty good at uh, restoring old photos, making them look new, or just making them look good, or or giving them a, a just like reviving them. I also do, uh, I build websites. I design and build websites. That I enjoy tremendously. And I can uh, design pretty much anything. Invitations like wedding invitations, uh, uh, baby shower invitations. I can uh, design announcements like say a wedding announcement or a graduation announcement. I can design greeting cards, business cards, postcards, uh, uh, flyers for events, uh, pretty much whatever you need, I can design. So that's what I'm doing to bring in a little bit of extra cash. And that I don't get a whole lot either because I'm just starting out, but it's, it's, it helps out. Now I have often stated to people that I consider my mom to be a special needs case, okay? Now, let me remind you of my mom's diagnosis. She was diagnosed with uh, dementia, with psychosis, and uh, major depressive disorder, which I never considered my mom to be depressed. But, you know, parents a lot of times hide things from their children. They don't want to be a burden on their children. I think it's more of a burden when you hide things. But, you know, that's a different story for a different time. Anyhow, though, I tell people often that she is a special needs case for several reasons. Number one, she's completely blind. I mean, she can't see anything. So that makes things even more confusing. Even before she had the dementia, being completely blind, I mean, it, it turned her life upside down. She went blind around 2010 at the age of, uh, how old was she in 2010? That was 11 years ago. She was like 72, 73 years old. So she went blind at that age. That's really tough when you're used to seeing your entire life. So that turned things upside down for her. Uh, she's also very hard of hearing in both ears. One ear, she's almost completely deaf. The other ear, it's a, it's a, more than moderate hearing loss. She does wear hearing aids, but because of the type of hearing loss she has, there's a lot of words she just simply doesn't understand, and a lot of things she doesn't recognize, such as music. You turn music on, and to her, it just sounds like a lot of screeching sounds. So there's a lot of things. There's not much that we can do to stimulate her mind, except for sit very close to her and keep her in conversation. Now, uh, you put the dementia on top of that, and then, with the recent passing of my brother, uh, I mean, my mom is just so, so, so confused. She's heartbroken. I mean, losing her son, my brother Chris, she loved him. I mean, he was her favorite, and I'm fine with that. And I know that he was her favorite. And she lost her son. And most days she talks like as if he's still here. And she'll ask me. I mean, this is so tough on me also. She'll ask me, well, when is Chris coming home? Has he gone to bed yet? Is he downstairs watching TV? And, you know, this these questions will come in the course of just a normal conversation and it always takes me back. I'm always stunned when she asks those questions and I don't know how to answer. So now I've just kind of come up with generic sort of answers. 
Oh yeah, he went to bed, just kind of agreeing with whatever she said. Yeah, he's downstairs watching TV. He's at work. Yeah, he's at work. Just kind of agreeing. Because I have been told that when a person with dementia experiences the loss of a loved one, they're not going to remember, even if they're told. And I did tell my mom the day after he passed. And uh, she accepted it. But then after four days, she forgot. So they say you don't want to keep reminding them over and over, telling them over and over that this person uh, passed away. It's like breaking their heart over and over and over again. So experts say just go along with it. You know, so and my mom, she's a special needs case. I mean, she has so much going against her. And it bothers me. It really does, because she is such a beautiful person. She is really a special, very cute, loving, sincere. She is sincere. She told me once, she goes, all I want to be is a good person. This is just right after my brother passed away. <laughs> and seriously, when she said that, it just brought tears to my eyes. All I want to be is a good person. I told her, Mom, but you are a good person. You're a beautiful person. We are out of cookies right now. Really? We're going to get some tonight with the grocery shopping. Hmm. I'll give you some money for cookies and candy. Okay. Remind me before you leave. Okie dokie. So, obsessive compulsive disorder. That's a big part of dementia. Uh, and uh, if you think you've ever seen OCD or experienced it, I don't think you've really know what it is until you deal with it with someone who has dementia. I mean, they will get on one thing and they will keep on it for hours. Two, three, four, five, ten, twelve, eighteen hours non-stop. And you can give them medication. And when they get into these fits of OCD, even the medication doesn't work. I mean, and if it does work, it takes hours and hours before it kicks in. I gotta go to the bathroom. So we're three hours into it now, and she's still going. She's resisting the medication, so now, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to give her something stronger which means she's going to end up sleeping for about 20 hours, and I don't like doing this, but it gets to that point. Okay, I'll take you to the bathroom again. This is like the fifth tower, yeah. fifth time in three hours. So the person with dementia, I mean, they get really very confused, I mean, all the time easily. Uh, but it's not only the person with dementia, it's also the caregiver. I mean, it, it, dementia is a really tricky, tricky illness. Very confusing. I mean, I'm, I, I mean, it's just like, once I think I, I have it down and have it figured out and know how to deal with it, it's just, I get thrown for a loop. And, uh, and I get confused. I'm like, I, I get confused often. And uh, sometimes I try to rationalize with my mom and try to make sense of things. And, and that's just, that's the wrong thing to do. You can't make sense of it. It's, it's you know, that's just not, that's not going to happen. I have more water, please. It's 
see it's been two hours now. She has drank three 16 ounce bottles com to completion. Of course I will refill it because she will, within about two minutes, be asking for more water. If I try to pace her and not give it to her, she has a fit and she will not stop asking for it. She's been playing around with her nose for over two hours now. Same thing with their throat, but once the OCD medication kicks in, which for some reason it's taking a long time, it's been an hour and 15 minutes since I gave it to her, but once it kicks in, uh, all of this goes away. The sinuses, the phlegm in the throat, the extreme thirst, it all goes away. It's pretty amazing. Chris? All of this is in her mind. Chris? Now we're four hours into this. Rick? Yeah? Put some water in here for me, please. Uh -huh. Boy. I'll pay you for I'm, it. I'm getting so tired, too. I'm so, so tired. My back hurts. And I'm having to get up about once every two minutes for something. Uh. Her nose, Kleenex, water going to the bathroom, the little Vicks nasal inhaler, you name it. Okay, I'll get you some more water. Hold on a minute. Everybody's been drinking water. Now when the OCD kicks in, she will not sleep. I mean, she will go for 18, 20, even as long as 35 hours before she falls asleep. Even if I give her the medication, she still resists sleeping. It's really amazing. And then she'll just ramble on and talk about just whatever. She's usually talking about arranging something, a big event, a car show, or it's usually something to do with business. And she just goes on and on. Dear little sweetie. What did you say? What's your name? My name's Rick. Rick? Yeah. Good. This is your son, Rick, Mama. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I love you, and I'm trying to help you out well, with whatever I'm you need glad. help with. I'm glad you can help me out because you're a good helper. Well, thank you very much. That's nice to hear, especially after all the mean things you just got done saying to me over the last four hours. <sighs> very, very tough going through this. So, uh, what? I am going to ask you, though, you know, to crawl into bed soon. Because I'm going to go to bed. It's like midnight right now. You know what? What? Can you get me a little paper towel and wet it a little bit so I can rub my eyes with that? Okay, your eyes. Back to the eyes now. Uh, yeah, sure. So I can move you if you will let me. Did you talk to the nurse or to somebody? There is no nurse here right now, Mom, because we're at home. Oh, my goodness. I don't know how I get myself into things like this. You're not into anything, Mom. 
you're just sitting here at home. There's no problems here. Uh, well, you know what? What? The best thing to do is to go to an emergency hospital right down the street. That's the best thing to do. But there is no emergency, Mom. Here, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Here, give me your hand. Turn, turn it upside down. What's that? That's some of that nice new hand lotion. Let's see if deflection works. It usually doesn't with her. Because her OCD is very, very, how can we say, strong. Oh, that, that lotion smells nice, doesn't it? Mm, yeah, pretty good. Smells very nice. That's a nice brand of lotion. I bought that for you for Christmas a few years ago. Yeah, she's not budging. Just have to wait for Did the medication. Did you give them our name? Mom. Huh? Huh. Oh, this is so tough. We are not at a hospital, Mom. We're at home. But Do she's not going to understand here. that. water here? Cups of water. I'm thirsty. When she gets in her OCD fits, she becomes very thirsty. And she drinks obsessively. She can go through 32 ounces of water within less than an hour. <laughs> so nurse said to sometimes when she gets like this just ignore her and eventually mm. Here, Rick. <clears throat> Eventually she'll calm down. I gave her some medication about 15 minutes ago. So I'm hoping that kicks in soon. We'll see what happens. Now she'll get back to the nose and if the medication hasn't kicked in, then she will be saying that she needs to go to the emergency room because of her nose. Shifts from her nose to her eyes to her throat. It's, you know, something different. Different reason why she has to be taken to the hospital. And they loved it. They did, huh? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd clean them real good and then get, let them have some. That's nice. You'd pick up oranges and plums, huh? Mm-hmm. Where did you get them from? Mm. 
Where would you get the oranges and plums from? They're from Bakersfield. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey. <laughs> they be, they've had some big crops over there lately. Yeah. Poor baby, she is so tired, but she won't go to sleep. It's been about 32 hours since she last slept. I even gave her a medication to help her, help her sleep, but she still refuses. What kind of party? Well, uh, similar to what we have here. Uh-huh. You know? Invite different, different people, and everybody can bring some of their own stuff. Ooh, that sounds good. Like a potluck, huh? Mm-hmm. That sounds really nice. I think we should do that, Mom. Yeah. I'm going to talk to the higher-ups. Yeah. Well, you're you're a real uh, you're a real mover and shaker, aren't you? Hmm? You're a real mover and shaker. Mm -hmm. You you like to get stuff done, don't you? Right. Hmm. You're very beautiful, also. And you know. Uh, if you get organized like that, but you could have some real good meals. Yes, you can. And make money on them. That's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. You can. But see, we're just starting. We're, we're little people. Uh-huh. Well, you got to start somewhere, right? Mm-hmm. You can't start at the top. Yep. Now let me tell you, this little lady really has a great sense of humor. <laughs> so can you tell me a funny joke? No, I don't know any. You don't? Come on, I bet you know one or two. Yep. Somewhere in your war chest. You know, you don't become 84 years old without knowing a joke or two. Oh, how was that? I said, you don't become 84 years old without knowing a joke or two. Oh, I'm sure you do. <laughs> what does the nose know? Nothing, huh? <laughs> it's just a nose knows. Uh, that I'm busy all the time? Yeah. Yeah, my mouth is busy. <laughs> 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 yep, 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 yep. <laughs> oh, you're precious. I love you, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight.